the college in North Carolina for five years. We missed you. Uh, five. Um, did about four years of ministry in North Carolina. Then I moved down here to Florida, and I lived in the Tampa area in Brandon for about uh, about six years. Met my wife here. I married a Florida girl. And then I started my traveling career in Nashville, Tennessee. Was there for 10 years. When all of a sudden, about 12 years ago, my wife says to me, you know, both of my brothers live up in Indianapolis. I sure would love to be closer to family. So I said, okay, we can move to Indianapolis. What I didn't realize when I said yes to this was that Indianapolis is not nearly as tropical as Tampa. <laughs> like, there's not very many palm trees in Indiana. I don't even think we have an ocean there. So it's very different. And I have to say, I'll just admit, for the first six or seven years, I kind of had a bad attitude. I would be out in the driveway shoveling that white powdery stuff in the sub-zero temperatures and, you know, it's blowing in my face and all I could think of is this white powdery sand on the west coast of Florida. And so, uh, about two years ago, I said, I was out there shoveling and complaining and I said, you know what, enough's enough. <clears throat> I put the shovel down by the garage, I went in the house and I made myself a nice hot cup of cocoa. And I sat down by the Christmas tree. And as I looked past that tree out the window into the Indiana grayness, as the snow was falling on the ice-covered streets, I made a decision. I said, my kids were born here. This is my home. I'm a Hoosier now. I need to stop complaining and have a better attitude. So right there by the tree, I decided to write a Christmas song. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if I could write a song that would perfectly describe Indiana winters and Christmases? And I could teach it to my kids and they could learn it and sing it and maybe someday they could teach their kids and their kids could teach their kids down through the generations to help remind them where their family tree first took root and what Indiana winters and Christmases are really all about. So tonight, I know it doesn't get cold here often, it was a little chilly earlier this week, but if you would ever travel north and experience a white Christmas or maybe you go visit some family north of here and it's cold, maybe you could teach them this song as well. Because I think, again, this really does sum up those northern winters and Christmases. This is called the Indiana Christmas Song, and it goes like this. Oh, the weather outside is frightful. And the weather outside is frightful. And the weather outside is frightful. And the weather outside is frightful. Outside is frightful, and the weather outside is frightful, and the weather outside is frightful. Did I mention that the weather is frightful? All oh, the weather outside is frightful, and that weather outside is frightful, and the weather outside is frightful, and that weather outside is frightful. yourselves a round of applause. Good job. That was impressive. You guys catch on quick. <laughs> so I went to a, a very small college. I went to Roanoke Bible College, which is in North Carolina. Uh, and when I say small, we didn't have a football team or nothing. Uh, but it was a perfect place for me. I learned a lot about the scriptures. I learned a lot about ministry. And I learned valuable life lessons. One of those life lessons I learned as a man was that guys should never, ever, and I mean ever, take a girl on a first date to McDonald's. <laughs> Apparently, it's just not classy, you know. You're in college, you don't have any money, you're trying to be thrifty, and it is thrifty. But I learned real quick, unless you step up your game and take that young lady someplace nice like Wendy's, you won't go out on a second date with her. That's for sure. So this is a little love song about uh, my first date in college. Do we have any country music fans here tonight? Country? Wow, that many of you? We, we should probably pray. Um, <laughs> this is a country song, and it's a love song about my first date in college. Uh, this is called Big Mac. Well, I went to take my... You know what? I'm going to move this up a little bit. I think I can do it.
Well, I went to pick my girl up at about a half past eight. She got the car, blessed me out, said you're an hour late. I said, now, honey, don't cross me. Let's go get ourselves a snack. I got my mind on one thing only. I want myself a Big Mac. Well, we walked into McDonald's at about a half past nine. She said, I'd like some McDonald's and cookies. I said, that'll be just fine. I went and placed the order, but as I came out the back, she said, I've changed my mind, my dear. I want some of your Big Macs. Don't ask for my Big Mac. Baby, don't ask for my Big Mac. I'll give you some of my French fries, but don't ask for my Big Mac. Well, we hopped into my pickup truck, and as I closed the door, she swiped a bite of my Big Mac and said, I'll have some more. Well, I just knew I'd change her mind when I turned on my charm. But she had a Big Mac attack and bit off half of my arm. Don't ask for my Big Mac. Baby, don't ask for my Big Mac. I'll give you some of my French fries, but don't ask for my Big Mac. So the next time that I ordered, I had learned the lesson by then. Instead of ordering one Big Mac, I went and ordered ten. Thoughts of sauce, less cheap, pickles, onion, toss, as we see, bun went through my head. But when I asked her for one of my Macs, this is what she said. Don't ask for my Big Mac, baby, don't ask for my Big Mac. I'll give you some of my French fries, but don't ask for my Big Mac. Don't ask for my Big Mac, baby, don't ask for my Big Mac. I'll give you some of my chocolate shake, but don't ask for my Big Mac. kind of a strange song for you now. <laughs> I like to mix things up a little bit. And uh, this, is a, this is a love song. You know, people hear the name Tony Wolf. They, they think love songs. And uh, this song is kind of neat because we always hear these love songs about this new love, or this, you know, these high school sweethearts, stuff like that. This is a song about two people who have lived and loved a lifetime and now they're looking back over the decades at this legacy of love they've left behind them. And in the story, the, the lady's name is Flo, and the man's name is Ebb. So the song is called Ebb and Flo. door. His old muscles are sore from piddling around in the sun. And Flo, she's always there, iced tea by his chair, with praise for the work he has done. And even though this morning is like every morning, it's a comfort when you're growing old. They're satisfied just to wake up alive. That's the good life of ebb and flow. After lunch, the dishes are done. Her stories are wrong. She lives for the days of our lives. And he's out like a light, snoring with all his might. But he secretly dreams of his bride And even though this day is like every day It's more precious than diamonds or gold The sweet simple things like stories and dreams That's the good life of them and flow Together they weather the storm With unwavering love they held on Till the light would break through the clouds And they laugh and they dance in the sun Flo kisses Ebb's nose To the bedroom he goes While she stays and turns out the lights and when they're finally tucked in, 
he turns with a grin, and his arms he holds are so tight. And even though this evening is like every evening, it's this time they cherish the most. Two lives intertwined and feelings so close. Each silently prays they're the first one to go. And that's the life of ebb and flow. So, um, man, it is hard for me to believe, but January 17th of 2004, I, for the very first time, became a dad. <laughs> believe that? Yeah, the, uh, the government finally granted me permission to reproduce, and um, <laughs> my wife said we should hurry up before they revoke the license, and so she wanted a little girl, you know. My wife grew up with brothers. She never had a sister, so she wanted a little girl. I gotta admit, I did too. Something about dads and daughters. We would have taken either from the very first try. God blessed us with a little girl that we named Brooklyn, like the city in New York. Then in the summer of 2005, we had our second child, another little girl, and we named her Katie after a family friend. Then, just like clockwork, summer of 2007, we had our third child, Another girl, and we named the third one Adrian, like in the old Rocky movies. And uh, now with three little girls in my household under the age of 17, I am in the midst of my 20-year stay on Planet Estrogen. <laughs> Love being a dad to daughters. We thought we were done, but God had other plans. Summer of 2009. We had our fourth annual baby, <laughs> and this time we actually had a little boy, and we named him Jude, like the New Testament book, or the Beatles song, whichever way you look at it. It's the only two places I've ever heard of that name. My wife liked it, so. Guys, tonight, um, I hope you had a really nice dinner, um, and I hope you'll take the time to, to really just kind of look beside you, in front of you, and back of you grateful for who you're here with, be grateful for your friends, your church family. 2020 has taught us anything, it's that tomorrow nothing's guaranteed. Back in February of 2018, my son jumped off the school bus and came running up the sidewalk like he does every Friday, so excited. He loves the weekend because he doesn't have to go to school. But also, he plays football and baseball, and this was Super Bowl weekend. He could not wait to watch the Eagles beat the Patriots, so he was excited. That was at 4.30. By 7.30 that night, my son had about 15 or 20 wires and tubes attached to him. He was in a medically induced coma, and they were putting him on a helicopter. They were airlifting him to Peyton Manning Hospital there in Indianapolis. He had contracted some rare strand of a virus called bacterial tracheitis, and it was crushing his windpipe. Only affects about one in every three million children the way it did his. The first 36 hours or so, I kept asking him, but he's gonna be okay, right? I just kept saying, he's in good hands, sir. They were only allowing one adult to stay the night in the ICU. My wife spent Friday night with him, and I went home with our girls. And then Saturday we switched, and I stayed there Saturday night. I woke up next to him on Sunday morning, and I went to call my wife to tell her there had not really been much of a change. It's funny how social media can drive a story I picked up my phone to call my wife, and there were over 350 messages from churches all over the planet. 
And I mean in Australia, London, England, here in America, all saying the same things. We stopped our services this morning to pray for Jude. We're praying for your son. I've never seen prayer more evident than in that situation. See, if those prayers kept rolling in over the next couple of days, as fast as my little man went down, he started to fight back. On Wednesday, I heard a nurse in the hallway say, no, 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 no. <laughs> Check his charts. This can't be right. This is impossible. I sat in there thinking, lady, I don't serve the God of the possible. I serve the God of all things, including the impossible. Sure enough, on the 12th day, they came in and they said, we think we have an airway to work with. We're going to pull the tube from your son's throat today and see what happens. Now, in the beginning of this, we thought, I don't know if he's going to open his eyes again. I don't know, even if he does, is he going to be the same boy? But they pulled that tube and 10 minutes later, for the first time in two weeks, my son opened his eyes. He looked around the room, and as soon as I saw his face, I knew he, I knew who was in there. He squinted, he looked around, and he found me, and he said, Hey, Dad, who won the Super Bowl? <laughs> God is good all the time. Something that I became very convicted of in those two weeks, and I believe this with all my heart, even if it had gone the other way and my son hadn't have made it, man, he would be with Jesus right now and God would still be good. I don't really do serious songs. I play a toaster. But I got one kind of a short story of a song I want to play for you guys tonight that I have sung in every church that I've stepped foot in since I first laid eyes on my first daughter almost 17 years ago. This song is about dads and daughters. It's about parents and kids. But it's also about the only thing that could be more important, which is how and where we spend our eternity. This song is called Forever, and it goes like this. <laughs> Fill my door. 
I wish she were for forever. When flowers have died around my graveside, you'll know that I've gone to the Father. My daughter will be soon there with me, but will be transformed to children of four. I like that better than his toast song. <laughs> I did. Oh man, has it been good to be in God's house tonight? Yes, yes. And to those of you that uh, prepared ribs and made cookies at home and everything, thank you so very much. Um, I know for me it's, it's great just to have a home cooked meal sometimes. And um, it's, just, it's just great to be able to sit and talk and just have fellowship with, with our brothers and sisters. And so, what a great night. Um, I don't really, um, when I go to churches, I, believe it or not, I don't really care if people laugh with me or near me or at me. None of that really matters. One of the greatest things I get to do in my life is see people smile. And each night I love it because, now tonight I don't really see that guy, but usually there's that guy in the back of the church. <laughs> Sits this way the whole time. <laughs> 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 you just didn't see him yet. So my job is done when I see that guy go, that boy ain't right. Uh, 2020, wow, uh, what a year. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm really looking forward to 2021. Anybody else? Yes. Of all places, believe it or not, I was standing in the streets of Tombstone, Arizona when I got a phone call. I was out there on the West Coast traveling with a band called the Sidewalk Prophets, and I decided I had the afternoon off. I thought, I'm going to run down to Tombstone and learn more about Doc Holliday and Wyatt Earp and all those guys. So I'm standing in front of the OK Corral when I get this call, and it says, hey, there's this virus. We don't know what it is, uh, but we're going to do the show tonight in Phoenix, and then everyone's going home. We're going to be off for about a month. That was nine months ago. <laughs> and so uh, from that time forward, um, probably everybody in this room knows someone who's been out of work. All right? I know it's affected our family greatly. Um, some people have lost their businesses. And sometimes those businesses were decades in the making, and it's all gone now. Everyone in this room knows someone who has probably been ill, or maybe yourself, who've been ill during this time. It's a serious thing. Still, there are other people that have not been able to visit loved ones, have not been able to attend funerals or weddings. And so it's been a crazy, crazy year. But church, I've been making it a point for the past two months now, as I run all over the country, to do two things. Yes, I love to see people smile and laugh. I love to bring joy. 
But I want to bring a reminder tonight that, that in the face of all of this stuff, we are still so very blessed. We are so fortunate. We are. And I'll take it a step further. I know it's not popular to say this nowadays, but we are fortunate that we live here. We're fortunate to be Americans. We really are. And, and you know, honestly, I don't say we're fortunate because we've got nice buildings or we've got SUVs in the parking lot or bank accounts or homes or whatever. Because the stuff doesn't make us blessed. Our, our, our resources don't make us blessed. Our resources make us responsible. I believe that. All right? Our blessing is Jesus Christ. What he did on the cross does for us today and into eternity. He is our blessing. But still, we're very, very fortunate. I've spent the last 12 years running all over the planet, actually, not just the U.S., but I've been a globetrotter without a basketball. And I've been to, I mean, so I've been to Africa several times. I've been to South America. I've been to El Salvador, the Dominican and Haiti. I've been to Mexico, uh, working with different missions projects that help children. And in all those travels, I can tell you, every time I get off the plane, I'm glad I'm there, and I'm glad I get that opportunity. But I'm even more grateful that I know I'm going to come back in a couple weeks to a country where I was so blessed that somebody loved me enough to tell me about Jesus Christ. And so this is a great place. Um, I can tell you a lot of stories tonight. I want to tell you about two people that I met on a trip to Ethiopia. Now, I want to tell you about Ethiopia because if you remember, I don't know how many people remember this, but back in the 1980s, Michael Jackson and Willie Nelson and Stevie Wonder and all these musicians, they came together and they wrote a song. Does anybody remember that song? We are the world. We are the world. Boy, somebody just sang it out. We are the world. And I remember every week as a kid, I would turn on the radio and I would hear, once again this week, coming in at number one, we are the world. I'm Casey Kasem. And I would hear this every single week. The song was number one for almost a year. None of those musicians took any money from that song. That's the truth. They funneled it all into the economy in Africa towards the famines, largely in Ethiopia. And then there was Live Aid, and again, the Rolling Stones and Queen and all these bands played, and they donated all the proceeds into that African economy. I can tell you from having been there, there's still po great poverty in Ethiopia and in Africa, but for the last 35 years since that effort, their economic situation has continued to improve. Pretty amazing thing, really. But a lot of people don't realize is, that the gospel was proclaimed in Ethiopia during that time like never before as well. And I got to see the fruits of that labor as well. Now I want to tell you guys tonight, because we just had this great meal. If you've ever traveled internationally or if you ever do, I can promise you one of the first things you're going to wonder to yourself is, what am I going to eat for the next couple weeks? You know, this is Ethiopia. They used to not even have food there, you know. And so I really did. I really thought about that. And, and sure enough, we got over there, we got off the plane, we go through Addis Ababa, the capital there, and we were going to a ministry center, and they were going to tell us what we were going to be doing for the next couple of weeks. Well, as we're walking in the building, I happened to notice another building off to the side with a big sign that said, such and such pizzeria. I thought, oh boy. I looked in the window, and it looked like our New York style pizza. It looked great. I thought, well, if nothing else, I know I can come back here a couple times. We went inside, and that's when things got interesting. The trip leader said to us, Today, we are traveling to Project 512. We are going to meet children who have been sponsored by people all over the globe to receive an education, to learn a vocational skill, and to receive the good news about Jesus Christ. We will go to their classroom. Then we will go to their chapel to have worship with the children, and after chapel we'll break for lunch and go next door to a pizza place. <laughs> I thought, whoa, wait a minute, there's a pizza place here and there's one where we're going? We drove 15 minutes to get to this project, and along the way, I counted about eight or nine more pizza places. So I went to the trip leader and I said, please don't take offense, but I never really pictured pizza in Ethiopia. Like, what gives? And he wasn't trying to be funny, but he said to me, Oh, yes, you must realize Ethiopia is the one African country that has never been ruled from the outside. Years ago, Mussolini comes to rule us. 
but we drive him back and we defeat his army. But we keep his food, we like it. <laughs> so for the next three weeks, I had spaghetti and lasagna, calzone, stromboli. I gained weight in Ethiopia. I didn't even think that was possible. Also found out that coffee was actually born in Ethiopia, and I had some of the best coffee I've ever had in my life while I was there. But more than the, the food or the coffee or the unintended sense of humor, the Ethiopian people were so funny. I fell in love with the heart of the people that I met there, and it was a game changer. It changed the way I view everything. I want to tell you about two people I met. The first day, we went to the school, the chapel, we got the pizza, we came back to the school. And we met a young single mom. She had three children. The oldest was a little boy about seven years old. He had been sponsored by somebody here in America. So he was getting to attend the school and this was his first day. She also had a little boy that was about three or four. He wasn't old enough for school. And a baby girl in his arm, in her arms. At the end of the school day, the mother said to us, we would love for you to come and see our home. We agreed, but as we were saying yes, the school quickly jumped in and said, please understand, this is their first day here. We are working for suitable accommodations for this young lady and her children. I thought, oh boy, where are we going? We started walking, and it felt like a couple miles. It probably wasn't even quite a mile. We walked through row after row after row of these little corrugated metal boxes, these little tin shanties. Any of you guys who were military, you probably know what I'm talking about. Little, little boxes, six, seven, eight people living in these tiny little places. Then we came up on the city landfill, big garbage area there in Addis Ababa. And I've never, in all my travels, I've never seen anything quite like this. The minister directed us towards a corner of the landfill. And he said, we've got a community of about 15 families that have come here. The garbage was piled about 20 feet high, huge landfill. They burrowed a, a cavern out of the side of the garbage piles. And these families were living underneath of the garbage in Addis Ababa. I've never seen anything like that. Folks, we've got a lot to be grateful for as we transition from Thanksgiving into Christmas. Man, we've got so much to be grateful for. I thought, where are we going? We walked past there, the landfill, went just a little further to where we, we came to two buildings. Now, we've got this phrase in America, that place is a real hole in the wall, right? Most of us have said that or heard that. This was a space in between two buildings. And it wasn't an alley, it was a space. We had to get sideways to even try to get down to where we were going. There was a little hole in the bottom in the cinder block, the foundation. Today we were walking around a couple of places here and like the foundation was kind, of a, was kind of leaning a little bit. This was like somebody took a sledgehammer and just hit a hole in the side of the wall. We got down on our hands and knees, we shined a flashlight in there, and when we looked inside, it was just a couple blankets on the ground. The lady said, this is where me and my children sleep, this is where we live, and this is where we keep our things. There's a couple of plastic bowls and a wooden spoon. That was it. We got out of there, and. I remember I grabbed her hand and her kids were there and the other guys in our group and I said to her, we, we heard the school was going to find a better place for you guys, a more suitable place for y'all to live, but in the meantime, how can we pray for you? And I'll never forget this young lady. Her smile went from ear to ear. She just beamed with joy. She said, oh my goodness, you would pray for us? Tell God, thank you, because we lack nothing. Church, I dare say, if we left out these doors tonight and had to go in town here someplace, get on our hands and knees on the ground and climb in the side of a building, lay on the ground, we wouldn't say we lack nothing. We'd say we have nothing. It was a perspective changer. I want to fast forward three weeks. That was the first day. The last day, and I could tell you stories about every single day I was there, people like that that I met. The last day, a little boy came up to me. His name was John. We went to an orphanage. 
at one of the projects. And this little boy was eight or nine years old. His name was John. He was out in the field playing football, soccer. They, they call soccer football. It was soccer. They're out playing soccer. He comes running over. I don't know why he picked me out. But he runs over to me and he goes, Go Eagles! <laughs> Apparently he plays for the Eagles. I don't even know who they were playing, but I started rooting for the Eagles. I looked back at him and I said, Go Eagles! And he just lit up. He ran out on the field. Anytime something good happened, he'd come over and give me a high five. I'd give him a high five back. He told me his name was John. I told him my name was Tony. And then he... <laughs> <laughs> he kept running over and pointing at me and laughing. He thought I was funny looking because, well, that's not even important. Um, <laughs> anyways, this went on and on. And at the end of the game, he ran over and he said the strangest thing to me. He ran over and he said, Mr. Tony, after football, I want you to come meet my mama. I said, all right, John, after football, we're going to go meet mama. He ran out on the field and I thought, wait, this is an orphanage. What's he talking about? Sure enough, the game ended. His coach came over with him. And he said, yes, John does not live here yet. He and his mother live right over here. And I don't know if you guys remember Gilligan's Island, the show, but it was like a little greenery hut, a little bamboo and greenery. It looked like something like Gilligan's Island. I walked in there, and I got to meet Mama, and she was awesome. But I wasn't there five or ten minutes before I knew exactly what was happening. She said, when John was a baby, his father went off to work one day and there was an accident. And he never came back. I've been doing the best I can for my son. The doctors have recently told me that I'm stage four of cancer and they don't give me much time. She said, a year ago, this project, the child fund, and the orphanage approached us. They told us, there are two teenagers in America who have recently gotten married and they have decided to sponsor your son, John. They're going to send a dollar every day. With this money, we can give him an education. We can guarantee that when you're not here anymore, he'll have a place to live. We're going to teach him. She got a big smile on her face. She said, he just got all A's on his report card. He's so smart. I'm so proud of him. They're teaching him to play football. And two days a week, he stays after school, and they're teaching him to work on cars. When I'm gone, and he becomes a man, he'll have a good job. He brings home food and clean water every day. Brings me medicine. They value me as his caregiver. And then she said, five months ago, they had a vacation Bible school at the project. My son brought Jesus Christ into this home for the first time. Now he is Lord of my son's life, and he is Lord of my life. I can never repay this. She filled up and she said, Now I know because of our great God and two of his faithful servants in America, no matter when I leave this place, my boy will never be an orphan. I was quickly reminded of a scripture James 1, 27. Y'all know what that says, right? Don't worry, no one else does either. James 1, 27 is a verse we usually don't talk about in church much. Listen to this verse, James 1, 27. And there's a reason I want you to hear this. Religion that God accepts as pure and faultless is to look after orphans and widows in their distress and don't be polluted by the world. That's what the Word of God says. Acceptable religion to God is looking after people in need. I was born in August 1968. That's right, I'm 79 years old. And the moment I was born, I was placed immediately into an orphanage out in Western Maryland. I was from a broken home before I even got here. And my birth mother, she was left alone. She couldn't take care of me, and she knew it. Her family wouldn't help her. So I went into foster care. Every weekend was somebody different. Uncared for, unwanted orphans, that was me. But while that was taking place, a 17-year-old girl, a teenager, wrote her husband-to-be a letter 
See, they, she had just graduated high school. They just got engaged, and one week later, he got drafted into the U.S. Army and went off to serve in Vietnam. So he's on the other side of the planet, and this young lady writes him a letter one day and says, I've been praying for you every day, in the morning, before I go to bed at night. I find myself praying all through the day that wherever you're at, you're safe, and that this, this war will soon end so you all can come home. But every day when I've been praying, God has been laying on my heart this calling, this desire to be a mom. I really believe that's why God put me on this planet. I'm supposed to be a mom. And when I pray, I don't think God wants me to wait and you get back and get married and have kids. I think God wants me to be a mom right now. That GI got that letter and he read it and he said, Say what? I wish I could have seen his face. But then he prayed about it and he wrote her back. He said, you go find a child who has nothing, who has no one. We'll take him in and we'll raise him together as our own. So she started looking. During the process, and it took a while, he got back and they got married. And wouldn't you know, a couple weeks later, they walked into the room where I was being kept. Walked right up to my crib. They picked me. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's not even true. My mom told me a few years ago, she goes, you know, we went in there to find a little girl. <laughs> I said, Mom, you missed it by a long shot. <laughs> she said, well, I heard your voice. We walked in that room and all these babies are quiet. You're over there just laughing and carrying on. Imagine that, right? I was doing my first show. <laughs> So all I could think when I first saw you was, I don't know anything about this child. He's not my blood. I don't even know what his name is. But I know this little boy needs a mommy. So she picked me up out of that crib. And along with her 21-year-old husband, they took me home and for the next 18 years, all right, for the next 40 years, <laughs> Anytime I needed anything, I always had it. Roof over my head, clothes on my back, shoes on my feet. I got to play baseball and go to school. I was taken to church even when I didn't want to go. I was out of age, you know. But that's the first time I ever heard anything about God or Jesus or the gospel. It was when my mom would drag me off to church. There's not one single day that goes by in my life where I don't thank God for her and what she decided to do for me. There's this scripture, and I'm going to get running close. Um, Matthew 25. I know Tracy would say the same thing, but he's standing up here tonight. We're not saved by the stuff we do. And I'll clarify that. See, without the grace of God and blood of Jesus, we wouldn't have any hope. We'd be lost. But I've always found it interesting that Jesus said, and I don't know if you knew this or not, in the New Testament, Jesus said, one day we're all going to leave this place, and when we do, we're going to stand before God, and we're going, just like my mom heard my voice, and just like I heard John's, we're all going to hear God's voice. And according to the New Testament, there's only one question Jesus mentions there in Matthew that we're going to be asked. We're going to hear God's voice, he's going to say these words. What did you do for the least of my brothers? Because whatever you did for them, that is what you did for me. What will we say, church? I, I think about that all the time. My mom's going to have a pretty good answer, I think. What will we say? If you've ever been to a Christian concert, I don't know how many people have ever been to Mercy Me or Michael W. Smith or anybody been to a Christian concert before. You know, there's always a guy that comes out at the end and holds up a picture of a little child. And he said, this is a child packet. We're going to pass out child packets. Here's a child packet. And they pass them all through the arena. Have you ever seen this done? Sort of. Yeah. i, I got to say, I don't care for that a whole lot. But, and, and here's why. Um, 
I've traveled all over the world, all these different places, and I've met a lot of these kids. This is not a packet or a piece of paper. This right here is Christian. That's his name. Christian lives in Ecuador. And he's as real as that little baby right there who's, I, I already knocked that baby out. And he's like, man, can we put on some cartoons or something? Um, but yeah, the only difference is this little fellow wasn't born here in America, you know? See, when I was watching them orphans playing soccer, it occurred to me, if I'd born, been born in Ethiopia, I, my picture would have been on one of these. So Christian here, he's a real kid. About, I don't know, a little over a month ago, it was kind of neat that Tracy had, had booked me back in May or June, whenever it was. It had been a while. Um, but I was planning on just doing one week down here in Florida. I got a call from the child fund, and they said, hey, man, we got 250 kids that have been waiting about a year to be sponsored. Can you help them? So I said, you know what? I'm going to turn that week into a month. 250 kids, a lot of kids. Well, after tonight, like Tracy said, tomorrow morning I'm going up to Lakeland, then I'm going to Titusville, then I'm going to West Virginia for a show, and I'm going home. So I got three more after this. As of last night, we are down to 31 kids left. We've already seen 219 kids sponsored. So we're down to the very nitty gritty. Now tonight, if you're like me, this has been a rough year, 2020. And if it has, you don't even need to listen to another word that I say. But if anybody here tonight feels so blessed, they feel like, you know what? I, I, could, I could take a dollar a day and pour it into the life of a child. I put a handful of them on that table right back there by the hand sanitizer and the uh, napkins and stuff. And uh, you can go over there when we're done. If you're so inclined, you can pick one out. All you do is fill out a little information card so we know where that, who has that child, and you start sponsoring. And church, it's a bill. You, you'd be sending Christian here, you'd be sending him a dollar and eight cents a day, just over a dollar a day. And let me personify that for you. That's a small Coke at McDonald's, all right? I was, I was at this church a year ago, and I said that, and this lady down front, for some reason, felt the need to blurt out, I get my drinks from Starbucks. I said, well, you can help 10 of these kids then. <laughs> it really is perspective. Actually, to tell you the truth, when we took our first child, my wife, what a saint, she came to me and she said, Tony, um, this is Kayla. She lives in the Philippines. You think we could cancel one pizza night a month so a child could survive and know Jesus? I said, yeah, I think we could do that. I, I need to eat less pizza anyway. And so that's how we did it. We just... You know, we canceled a pizza night, said no to a soda here and there. And uh, so anyways, when we get done tonight, if you want, you can just go over there. Pick them out's the hardest part. They're all going to look at you. Uh, but after that, it's easy. Um, I want to say this tonight. Thank you guys so much for hanging out here after the meal um, to see a portly old bald guy play a toaster. Um, I, I really appreciate it. Um, but mostly just for hearing this message, this isn't a sermon or some sales pitch or something stupid like that to me. I started writing my story 50 years ago and I, want, I used to wonder why, why my life started the way it did. But then I got to meet these kiddos and realize that I can be a voice for them, the ones that can't speak up for themselves. And I believe that's what God's called me to. So I will never ever, I've been doing this now for about nine years and we've seen 65,000 children sponsored through this effort. I'll never stop. I'll never, ever stop doing this. If God gives me 100 years on this earth, mark your calendars. Tracy, I'll be back here in the year 2068 to do a little show. Stand up here, beat on my toaster and go, yeah. I don't remember. <laughs> and then I'll, I'll fight for these kids. Um, God bless you. I want to pray for you guys. I'm going to turn it back over to Tracy again. Boy, and, uh, let's, let's pray. Father God, thank you so much. The ribs. Thank you so much for homemade cookies. Thank you for the people that came in here today and spent hours, and maybe even yesterday, dedicated hours to make sure that this meal would happen. God bless them for just serving. Um, Lord, thank you for this church. And uh, Father, I pray uh, for every heart in this room tonight, not mine included, that all of us would say, you know, what can I do to, to, to better serve? Whether that means sponsoring a little boy in Ecuador, if that means saying, hey, next time there's a meal, let me come down here and help cook some stuff. Or maybe it means, you know what, I'm going to go right down the street. There's a, 
there's a person in my neighborhood that I know has a great need, I'm going to go help them. God, I pray that everyone in this room will, will want to be more like your son, will want and desire to serve your people. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your mercy, your grace, your love that's so big that you were compelled to send your only son, your only child to this earth to die for people like us. God, I, I pray that will allow us to have great joy, just knowing that, that, that we're loved. Um, Lord, we pray all of this tonight in the blessed name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I believe that Jesus is worth living for because he believed that I was worth dying for. God bless you guys. How many of you like to get toast? <laughs> I'm just going to tell you that I forgot to turn on the camera and that's not on our tape. So it's not on our tape. Okay. So what does that mean? Maybe I guess I, I got to do it one more time. That means maybe they know the words good. by now and they could. <laughs> Would you guys do yeah toast one more time so that? Yeah. I know that Steve and Cindy and some of them that can't be here because when they just have things and we told them that we'd let them see this so they missed yeah toast. And you would like to see yeah toast again, wouldn't you? Yes, and Mom. my mom reminded you. Yeah, so, so can we do that real quick? Oh, oh that's it. great. It's and then, uh, and then <laughs> while he's getting ready to do that because he has to tune up that toaster, yeah. uh, he does have some pictures over here and. Um, He's going to put out a couple more pictures over here on this table so that they're spread so you have time to look at them. Because I happened to look at that table when you did that, and they will look right back at you. Um, you'll see their face. So, uh, if you have the ability to sponsor one, they always, they always get to me. So, uh, we can do that afterwards. So, yeah, toast. So one more time, I'm going to need your help. Uh, this is written by the great Haywood Bax, and this is called Toast. It goes like this. All around the country and coast. People always say, what do you like most? I don't want to brag, I don't want to boast. I always tell them, I like toast. Yeah, toast, come on. morning about 6 a.m. Have a little jelly, have a little jam. Take a piece of bread, put it in the slot. Push that lever and the wires get hot. I make toast. Yeah, toast. Yeah, toast. Now, there's no secret to toasting perfection. There's a dial on the side and you make your selection. Push to the dark or the light and dead. If it pops too soon, press it down again and make toast. Yeah, toast. Yeah, toast. For many years now, I've been a booster of the browning of the bread inside a toaster. If it gets dark, I start hollering. Because don't you know I'm black toast intolerant? Yeah, toast. man came in from the dregs, didn't know what would go with the bacon and eggs. Must have been a genius, got it in his head. Love the toaster in the wall, buy a bag of bread and make toast. Yeah, toast. Yeah, toast. Oh, we oh, sure, bone George to part that. <laughs> oh, home press, all day, Chevy Corvette. Oh, Risa Valley, I feel tell Oh, we oui, Marie bon, get bonsoir. French toast. French toast. Yeah, toast. Yeah, toast. Yeah, toast. <laughs> anyway, be sure to tell everybody tomorrow what they missed. <laughs> we might have toast, we might have French toast in the morning, we don't know. We'll see. Um, let's go to Lord in prayer and uh, thank, thank him for our evening and thank him for having Tony come to us. And like that. Father, we come to you, we thank you so much for tonight, for the fellowship we shared, for the meal that we shared, for the ability we have just to gather together and to fellowship together. 
Father, we thank you for Tony, for his ministry. We thank you for his passion for the, for the kids. And Father, we just pray that uh, we can step up. That uh, if there's some need that, that we have that we can fill, Father, help us to uh, fill that need. Father, guide us throughout this year, the rest of this year. Guide us through this season as we, as we approach the Christmas season. Father, uh, help us to be ready for Wednesday night when we share with the uh, children of this community Christmas with you. Father, just guide us tonight in a safe journey. So thank you for allowing us to be here. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. So we have the pictures out. If you want to do that, you can stop and talk to Tony. So if you want to talk to Tony. Uh, those of you assigned to clean up next door, you can do that now. <laughs> I'm going. <laughs>